Our first speaker, keynote speaker this morning is Dr. Gary Egger, who has qualifications in behavioural biology and epidemiology and has worked in public, corporate and clinical health for over four decades. He is the author... I, I, I was impressed if somewhat, uh, some of the speakers have written three and five books. And uh, Gary has authored not 10, not 20, but 30 books on and over 160 peer-reviewed scientific and research articles and numerous popular media articles on health and fitness. He's a professor of health and human sciences at Southern Cross University and he's an advisor to the World Health Organization and several government and corporate bodies in chronic disease prevention. In the 1990s, it was the brainchild and the, and, and the inspiration that came from Dr. Egger to initiate Gut Busters, which was a men's weight loss program, and it was the first of its kind anywhere in the world. The great innovation that comes from this country is remarkable. And he started training programs for fitness leaders in Australia way back in 1982, before it was trendy, before it was groovy. And he is a real pioneer and was one of the initiators of the Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association in 2008. He recently received an Australia Medal for his services to medical education and health promotion. And his recent interests include lifestyle, obesity, chronic disease, climate change, and economic growth. He was educated in the at the University of Newcastle. And he's going to be talking to us about changing lifestyles that are causing chronic disease. His greatest achievement, despite that incredible CV, his admission to me was that he is still alive, which I think, yes, that is a remarkable achievement. But I think a, an equally remarkable achievement is the fact that he has walked the coast from Queensland to Victoria. And he arrived to Batemans Bay before busting his knee and needing a knee replacement. But he is a man who is a pioneer in his field way back for many decades, and let's give him a remarkable, fitting welcome to Professor Gary Egger. Thank you, Stuart. I noticed as a Novocastrian, he said that I was educated at Newcastle University. That was only one of three universities. There was the University of Western Australia and Sydney University as well have to take some of the responsibility for, for my education. Um, and I thank the planning committee of uh, APNA for inviting me. I'm very honoured. I've always been a great supporter of uh, practice nurses right since the early days. And uh, I think you're still overworked and underpaid. And I'm trying to do as much about that as I possibly can. <clears throat> but I think the future for practice nurses is, is enormous. Uh, and as we'll see as we go along with this, I think in the area of lifestyle medicine, you've got a huge future and uh, huge potential that needs to be that needs to be um, uh, added to. <clears throat> so I want to talk, talk a little bit today, and I'll move through this reasonably quickly. Some of the concepts would require a lot more uh, time, but I'll, I'll move as, as quickly as I can because, uh, in the um, uh, honour of the other, uh, the other um, speakers as well. I want to talk about the rationale behind lifestyle medicine, what it's all about, and then the components of lifestyle medicine, uh, what we've gotten to, to at the moment. And the rationale is uh, based around the changes in uh, disease structure that we've had over the last, particularly the last 20 or 30 years. Um, every time you get changes in society, you get changes in disease, types of disease. It's happened right back throughout history. And of course, the biggest change in the last 200 years was the Industrial Revolution and now the Technological Revolution. With the Industrial Revolution, we got a decline in infectious diseases, as you can see with the red line there. Um, you see there's a little tick at the end of that and we don't know where that's going with the MERS and SARS and all the other infectious diseases that are coming up. But you'll see that with the advent of the technological revolution, which really began only in the 70s and 80s, uh, we started to get this rise in chronic diseases. And where you get that crossover point is called the epidemiological transition, which happens as a country develops. And 
uh, it's happening in China and India at the moment. It happened in Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom. Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s is where chronic disease has taken over from infectious diseases. And uh, the best evidence of this is the rise in obesity. As, as Stuart pointed out, obesity has been one of my areas of, of interest over the last 20, 25 years. And you can see the huge rises, particularly in obesity, not just overweight and obesity, but in obesity, uh, it's from, uh, from around about 1990 when it took off. I remember I wrote the first article on this. It was the cover story in the bulletin in 1991. It was called The Apple and Pear Generation, where I was trying to... I could see this epidemic coming and trying to point out the problems that we're likely to have with that in the near, near future. <coughs> um, we know <coughs> that um, as a result of uh, improvements in in living standards that we are living longer, uh, and Australia is one of the longest living communities in, in the world at the moment. The question is, are we living better? And you have to say, looking at that, those figures on obesity, that maybe we're not. Um, we've also now got new figures to show that uh, the increases in disability are greatest, even in younger age groups, than they were greater than they were in previous years. So the indications are that we are living longer, but we're not necessarily living better. And that's our next big goal, is to try and learn to live better. And one of the problems with that, of course, is reducing chronic disease, which makes up about 70% of all appointments to primary care. They're the people that you're seeing all the time. And we can't deal with this like we deal with, dealt with infectious diseases. It's not something that you can just give somebody a pill to go away and hope that they get better or that it will get better in time. Chronic diseases get worse in time, whereas infectious diseases typically get better over time. We know that with the, the uh, uh, infectious diseases, it, they benefited greatly from the advent of the germ theory, which came out of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Immunisation, public health... Um, the range of factors that, are, that were attacking this monocausal focus, that is germs. Now, germs aren't all the same. There is a range of different microbiological organisms that fit under that category germs. But having this single focus of germs, we were able to deal with infectious diseases uh, better than we've been able to deal with any major disease, diseases right down throughout history. With chronic diseases, on the other hand, we still operate in silos. We have heart disease, we have cancers, we have respiratory problems, and we're still working with these in silos rather than having a single underlying cause. Now, when you look at this from an epidemiological perspective, what happens is you have a disease, you then look at the risk factors and the markers of that disease, then you go back to look at the determinants of that disease. These aren't causes. You can't talk about causes when you talk about chronic disease because it's not something that you can take out of one person and inject into another as, is, uh, or as was exemplified by Cox postulates back in the 1890s which, which was a demonstration of the cause of an infectious disease. That doesn't happen with chronic diseases. So we've only got determinants. But we've got proximal determinants, that is the immediate determinants. We've got medial determinants, which are the things that lead to the proximal determinants. And then we've got distal or upstream determinants. Now, to, to make this clearer, we'll look at uh, a number of different diseases. Coronary heart disease, for example, stroke, type 2 diabetes and cancers all have those risk factors and markers. And remember, obesity is not a cause of those diseases. It's, a, it's a, either a risk factor or a marker, and as are those other things, lipids and so on. We deal with those, we treat those in clinical practice, but we quite often miss the determinants, that is the proximal, the medial and the distal determinants, which are things like diet, inactivity, and just stopping at that is not good enough either. <coughs> It's like saying the cause of uh, food poisoning in Sydney is a restaurant in Sydney on one particular night. An infectious disease epidemiologist wouldn't think that's good enough. You've got to go into the restaurant, look at the type of disease, uh, try and deal, uh, look at the, um, the type of food that was eaten, try and work out who, who ate it and get down to the nitty-gritty of it. With chronic diseases, we don't do that yet. And yet, we've, we know that diet and inactivity and stress are the three major factors. We, haven't, we don't look at what caused that. They don't just happen uh, uh, for nothing. Um, and, and we know that stress, anxiety, depression, technology, all these other things lead to that. And we then even have to go back one step further because the environment, the physical, the political, the economic and the socio-cultural environment that we live in is responsible for this. As you will have noticed in last week, the... the, the uh, uh, World Health Organization figures on obesity came out showing that there is no country in the world at the moment that has been able to reverse the obesity trend. 
not quite right. There have been two countries that have reversed it. Cuba is one, when the Russians left in 1989 and they went broke, uh, and they lost a lot of weight and their, infection, their chronic diseases improved dramatically until the mid-2000s when they learnt to uh, make their own money, basically. So they got back on the economic treadmill and they're now increasing in fatness again. Nauru, up on the, the, the um, uh, equator where I've spent some time working with the WHO, is the only other country where this has happened. When they went broke, they ran out of superphosphate and they, became, they went from being the fattest country in the world to being less fat. They're still the fattest country in the world, but less fat. Their diabetes uh, dro uh, incidence dropped from 50% down to about 25-30%. Uh, so we, we don't have this underlying germ theory for chronic diseases, or we haven't had up until now. I'm going to propose one to you in a minute, and one that I've been working on pretty intensely over the last couple of years and have published in this area. We do know that there's something underlying chronic diseases uh, that we didn't know about 15 years ago. And that's this low-grade form of inflammation that is different to classical inflammation that uh, Aurelius Celsus described two, two and a half thousand years ago, which is designed to prevent the spread of infectious diseases by surrounding a microbial invader, uh, stopping that from spreading and, and therefore leading back to homeostasis at some stage. We haven't had anything up until now uh, underlying chronic diseases. And the infectious diseases have had this, uh, this uh, inflammatory approach, which is more like a raging fire that can occur over two or three weeks, but then returns the body to homeostasis. We only now know that there's also a a low-grade systemic form of inflammation, largely in the arteries, but, but now we know right throughout the body, in the organs of the body as well, that are not induced by a microbial organism, but more by lifestyle factors. And those lifestyle factors then lead on to oxidative stress, uh, insulin uh, metaflammation, which is metabolically induced inflammation, insulin resistance, and then that leads on to dysmetabolism, to chronic diseases, and to low-grade systemic inflammation over the long term. Now, the question is what causes that low-grade systemic inflammation? Because if it underlies just about all chronic diseases, then if we know what causes it, then we know what causes chronic diseases and we can put them into a category just like the germ theory and come up with a, an idea of how we can deal with chronic diseases on a single, singular monocausal mono basis. And John Dixon and I from the Baker Institute have been working on this for about the last six years and we've come up with all of these activities that cause metaflammation which then goes on to lead, to lead, on, lead on to chronic disease. Only some of these go through obesity, not all of them. Only some of them go through obesity. So it seems like we may have been chasing our tail when we're chasing obesity. We know that about a third of obese people are perfectly healthy. We know that about 25% of lean people have all the risk factors that you would expect of the obese. So we think now, or we're beginning to think, that obesity is a bit of a canary in the mine shaft. It's telling us that something's going wrong in society rather than something's going wrong in the individual. And maybe it's not the obesity that's the issue. It's what causes obesity that we should be focusing on. And that's where this whole approach of lifestyle medicine comes out. When we look at all of those factors that I just showed you, all those lifestyle and environmental factors, and we put them on a time scale, you find that, all, that most of the ones that are anti-inflammatory, that have a, an opposite effect on, on inflammation in the body, uh, have been around for thousands of years. Whereas those, those, are the, those that are pro-inflammatory have only been around for the last, well, at the most, 200 years, but more so over the last 50 or 60 years. And if you know anything about immunology, then we know that the human body adapts and it learns to live with certain uh, microbial organisms in the past anyway, that then uh, leads to immunity being developed. So these things that we've been used to over hundreds of years and thousands of years, we've become used to, our body has become used to, whereas the newly introduced products and lifestyle factors and environmental factors are uh, uh, we are not used to, the body's reacting to them, albeit in a lower fashion than a, than a, a life-threatening microbial organism, but it's still reacting to them uh, in, a, in a way that would be, um, that would uh, uh, cause the immune system to respond. What is this thing that underlies all those lifestyle factors? I've given it the term anthropogens. 
this is man-made environments, their byproducts and lifestyles encouraged by these, some of which may be detrimental to human health. Not all, of, not all of these, of course, are detrimental to human health. Some of them are detrimental. And clearly, if disease is man-made, then it can be man-prevented. So, we now have the germ theory for infectious diseases. We've got this anthropogens theory, which then leads on to what do we do about it? Well, what we do is look at uh, uh, processes that might, that where we might be able to change the behaviours, the lifestyle factors, the environmental factors that lead to these determinants of chronic disease. And that is lifestyle medicine, including public health and environmental mo modifications. So the, the working definition, sorry, I've gone too far here. The working definition of lifestyle medicine, we now have a, a world association, a global lifestyle medicine association uh, with the acronym GLAMA, G-L-M-A. Uh, there's an Australian association, an American association, they're crop, cropping up all over the world. And we've just come up with this uh, definition, the World uh, Association. It's a branch of medicine targeting prevention and management of lifestyle-related diseases with evidence-based interventions that integrate improvements in nutrition, physical activity, stress management, social support and environmental exposures. Now, this is not, this is not a, a replacement for traditional medicine or conventional medicine. This is a branch of medicine, just like, in, uh, just like uh, uh, travel medicine is a branch or environmental medicine is a branch of medicine. So we're not suggesting that this is going to replace anything, but what we have to do then is to work out what are the components, how do we deal with this as a separate branch of lifestyle medicine so we better cope with chronic disease, which we're not doing very well at the moment. And that's not from lack of trying. It's just that it's such a difficult area to, to, to change, to change the environment and the lifestyles that come from that environment. So I, I want to talk quickly about the content, the epidemiology, to show you that there's about 15 determinants of lifestyle medicine. And a, as any good epidemiologist, we've put this into an acronym, which you can remember. And then I'll talk a little bit about the processes of how you go about doing this. And I want to talk about um, different ways of modifying behaviour in uh, individual patients, including processes in clinical practice, such as not just seeing a patient one-on-one -on -one in a clinical practice, but seeing them in what's called a shared medical appointment. Uh, I have some money from the RACGP, or not just me, a couple of other uh, researchers working in this area, at the moment to test out this process of shared medical appointments, where we have anything from 6 to 15 patients in a room with a doctor, a facilitator, a practice nurse, and a documenter. We've now about a third of the way through this project and we're finding that 100% patients prefer this than the one-on-one -on -one consultation because they all help each other. They get peer support in the shared medical appointment arrangement. I'll come back to that. So first of all, the content and the science. What are the lifestyle and environmental determinants of chronic disease? And then I'll talk about the process or the art of how you do it in the short time that I've got left. So going back to this, this list of determinants of disease again, uh, we can put those into categories. Now, generally, we think that lifestyle determinants of disease are confined to nutrition, activity, and stress. And while they may be the penicillin, we call them, the penicillin of lifestyle medicine, because they are the key determinants of risk factors which then lead on to disease, they're certainly not alone. And if we consider this to be, these to be alone, we, we fall into this trap of victim blaming. It's the patient's fault, it's the patient's problem because their diet is not right, their activity is not right. And that's ignoring the larger environment that's driving them to do what they do. So there's a whole range of other factors. There's te te uh, technology induced pathology, which is another term that, um, that we've come up with, a new term. But it's, it's basically, as I said, every change in society leads to changes in diseases. The fact that we've got mobile phones, the fact that we've got computers, the fact that we use the internet these days leads to diseases associated with that. You may not be familiar with the fact that there's a, a term called Facebook depression now coming out of the medical literature with young kids who, who become depressed because of the, the links that they get on Facebook. I won't go into that in a lot of, lot of detail, but inadequate sleep, of course, is, is a big one. And the environment, we just cannot avoid, uh, but we tend to try and avoid it the macro environment and the micro environment, the bigger environment around which we all live, but then the micro environment that we have at our home. And then you've got occupation, these uh, drugs and alcohol are uh, important, in including iatrogenesis or you know, medically induced diseases, over and under exposure to light and sunlight and radiation, 
relationships and social inequity are two incredibly important determinants of disease that Sir Ma Michael Marmot, the expat Australian in the United Kingdom, was knighted for recognising and has written several books on this area. We just cannot avoid those areas. And then I, I, I realised when I was out working in an Indigenous community just uh, earlier this year out in Western New South Wales that, that we've missed something here. And that, that what we've missed is three other uh, determinants, and that is meaninglessness, lack of meaning or learned helplessness, alienation from society and lack of culture ide and identity, which is occurring in Indigenous communities, particularly amongst Indigenous men. I ran the Gutbusters program for many years up in the Torres Strait with Indigenous men, and it was quite successful because it was restoring meaning back into these men who've lost the meaning in their life through not having honey, honey and gathering uh, as their main role anymore in uh, society. Now, you, can't, you also can't divorce these 15 different determinants from each other because it doesn't work in a linear model. Weight is not equal to energy in minus energy out anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a systems model. That linear model, weight equals energy in minus energy out, is a physics model. It works in a laboratory where there's no biological organism. When you try and calculate it with a biological organism, you get feedback. You get changes in metabolic rate. You get changes in gut micro, microbiota, for example, which then leads to leaky gut, which then means that a calorie is no longer a calorie in a fat person. It becomes one and a half or two calories because of the change in gut microbiota. So it's, we're dealing with a systems model rather than a linear model, and that's much, much harder to work with because we have to take account of all of these factors, not just one or two of them. So that's the, the, the content, the epidemiology. I want to move now to look at the, the process or the art, and I'd love to have a lot more time to do this because I, I think it's fascinating. But let me just put some seeds into your mind about how, how we can do this. First of all, you've, there's the clinical approaches, uh, and that's the one-to-one -one approach, which is the traditional approach which has been around since the days of shamanism and witch doctors and so on, uh, where you've got one expert and one patient, uh, you've then got the group sessions, which have become much more popular these days, and we now have medical benefits item numbers for group sessions in diabetes and so on. Not taken up very well, uh, because, A, because they're not very well paid, but B, because they, one expert to ten people doesn't work uh, that well either in many cases. And then you've got the environmental interventions, which we can't avoid. That's population intervention. So advocacy and protest and policy change and public health are all important. I'm not going to talk about those today. I want to go back to the, these one-on-one uh, -on -one and the one-on-group sessions. And I'm going to talk briefly about brief assessments, brief interventions, <coughs> and, and the tools that you can use for these, because this is important. And then shared medical appointments I'll cover briefly when I finish up. So some of the lifestyle medicine tools that are around, and this is important, if you're going to differentiate lifestyle medicine from traditional medicine, what are some of the tools? What are some of the toys that you can use? Things like body fat measures. Now, we don't just measure weight, we measure body fat percentage. And I'll show you how you use that then to convert into an ideal body weight rather than using this ridiculous measure of body mass index that we've, we've hung to for 50 years, and yet we know that if we got all the... Um, the uh, state of origin players from the other night and measured their body mass index, that 90% of them would be regarded as obese. And yet these are the fittest men on the planet. They have the lowest percentage of body fat on, on the planet. Uh, we've got other tools there, such as grip strength dynam dynamometer. We're now recognising that grip strength, particularly in old age, is a great proxy measure of sarcopenia and of other risk factors, uh, particularly type 2 diabetes and met metabolic risk. Um, we've got the, uh, the movement sensors now. We don't, pedometers are out of date these days, just measuring steps. <clears throat> these things measure your movement in three or four different dimensions. They measure your sleep patterns at night. You download them into a computer. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we're using technology now to deal with the problems that technology has created. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you've got the things like the FlowWiz, which, which now means that you don't have to send a patient off for an overnight sleep study. You can do it in their own home. You get this from Sydney University. There's a whole range of these. I won't go into them all. Just quickly, this is the uh, BC601 BIA scales from Tanita. 
they not only measure weight and body fat, but they also measure these days visceral fat. They measure the fat in each limb and the muscle in each limb. They measure total body water and so on. So that you can measure, as I have at the moment, I've just had recently had the misfortune to have a knee replacement because of what Stuart said. I got to Bateman's Bay and the knee, knee gave out. I've had to replace it about nine weeks ago. And I can measure with the B BC uh, 601 scales that I've got uh, the improvement in my quadriceps muscle as I work that work the quadriceps muscle to get them back into action. So I know that the body fat in that muscle, in that leg, was higher than in the, the other leg to start off with, but now I'm regaining muscle and that body fat is, is going down. So these are very useful tools, probably most useful for something like this. This is measuring ideal weight uh, using body fat percentage. Um, and I w again, I won't go into this in detail, but let's say if you've got Bill Bloggs who's 100 kilograms and he's 35% fat, which gives him a BMI of 32.7%, his ideal B BMI, of t which is the top of the, I the ideal level, would be 24, uh, uh, which if you did the calculation, which is hard enough to do anyway, is 73.4 kilograms. Now, I've worked with Gutbusters men who are 150, 180 kilograms. I worked with the King of Tonga, who was 230 kilograms. To suggest that he get back to 73.4 kilograms is just a joke. So we have to come up with something different. And this is the little formula that you can do this with. And again, I don't have time to go into this in detail. It is available or will be available in the next week on our website, lifestylemedicine.com.au, for free. And you can go in and just type the... Once you've got the body fat and you've got the total body weight, you can work out the... The, uh, the body fat, the ideal body uh, weight from the body fat percentage. And you can work out a short term, a medium term, and a long term goal based on the ideal body fat percentage, which is for a man is tw up to 24%, for a woman it's up to 35%. And with this ideal body weight, we get down to the goal of 85.5, which is much better than this other one of 73.4, which is totally outrageous to suggest that happens. So, some brief assessments, and, and again, I, won't, I can't, don't have time to go into these, but things like body fat percent I've just mentioned. Waist circumference is another way of uh, assessing um, uh, potential risk factors because uh, that's where it's abdominal fat, even though it's more visceral fat these days that's important, where we need more internal measures, MRIs and so on. Abdominal fat still is uh, most important. Your triglycerides, uh, again and some of your internal measures. You may not be familiar, but there's a thing called triglyceride waste. If you've got a triglyceride of more than two, or a patient has a triglyceride of more than two and a waist circumference of more than that recommended level, which is around about 100 centimetres for a Caucasian male and 90 centimetres for a, a, a female, uh, then you've almost invariably got insulin resistance, which leads on, that's the dysmetabolism that I said to you that leads on to chronic disease. So you measure, you're measuring triglyceride anyway, you're measuring waste anyway. To put those two together gives you a great indication, a great assessment of potential lifestyle problems. And then you've got other questionnaires down here, a, a couple of which I'll, I'll cover uh, very briefly. There is this um, diet monitor. Now, any dietitian knows that to measure diet is very difficult to do because patients fib about their, their weight. And the fatter they are, the more they fib about it. We know that overweight women, for example, underestimate what they eat by about 80%. Uh, overweight men underestimate what they eat by about 30%. And they're, they're not consciously doing it. It's just that when you ask the question, they, they're thinking in their mind, well, I would like to eat less, and I will eat less today now that you've asked me. But tomorrow, you know, it's a different matter altogether. Um, so this is a brief, this has been validated against uh, uh, food recall diaries and, uh, and um, uh, other uh, ways of measuring, measuring food. It's very simple. It's a, a good uh, um, lead-in introduction to dietary problems that you might be able to use. Again, for depression, the pH2 has been validated against the longer measures of depression with, with about a 0.9 validity. And so you don't, there's only two questions that you need to ask. Uh, to, to get a, a, an indication of whether a patient is suffering from depression there. So then br brief interventions. Can you do a brief intervention on lifestyle, uh, as, you know, number, an item 23, for example, on lifestyle? And, and the indications are that you can't because this, ch this requires self-management. It requires a lot of uh, ongoing um, help assistance with a patient. But there are some brief interventions which have been shown to work. Smoking is one, depression is another, weight management is another. And again, uh, I'll 
quickly show you here some brief interventions that have worked with smoking. Um, there's a lot of new information. If I had time, I could go through this with you in, on, on smoking. A lot of good, uh, solid evidence now to show that um, the, the smokers that we have left in the community, we thought that they were going to be the easy ones now that we've got down to 15 or 16 per cent. Unfortunately, the ones that are left are the hard ones. And they're the, the fast metabolizers of nicotine. And if you're a fast metabolizer of nicotine, you find that you, you need to get that nicotine high. You need to smoke more to get that nicotine high up. So just slow, uh, trying to decrease your smoking level is not going to help. Uh, some of the nicotine replacement patches work very well. There are other ways to do it that are um, brief interventions, ways for doing that. So what are the differences then between this classical and lifestyle uh, medicine approach? I've got the, one, the classical medicine down the left-hand side. That's mainly a downstream focus. People come to you when they're sick, whereas we're looking at more upstream. Uh, you're mainly dealing with diseases and risk factors in the, uh, the classical approach, whereas we're, we're looking at lifestyle and environmental causes. And so on down there, the responsibility is more on the patient. The patient has to become a more active partner in care and so on and so on. So fitting this into a lifestyle medicine sort of model, we need to look for the cause of the cause. You can't just look at the risk factors. You have to go back and say, well, what caused this risk factor? What caused that cause? And what caused the cause of the cause? As the great English uh, epidemiologist uh, Geoffrey Rose uh, wrote back in uh, the 1990s, um, all good epidemiology looks not just for the cause, but for the cause of the cause and the cause of the cause of the cause. We need to use self-management principles and programs. And this is a whole uh, learning genre in itself to teach patients how to self-manage their problems. We need to focus on behaviour and environmental change because it's not just the individual behaviour and if we just we just focus on individual behaviour, as I pointed out before, that could lead, lead to vic victim blaming. It's the environment that we live in that drives people to behave the way they do. Um, we need to look at brief assessments and brief interventions where we can, but maybe also look at these alternative methods such as shared medical appointments, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. And then finally, team care. And we've got that now uh, with our team care arrangements and potentially with the shared medical appointments. Sorry, not finally. Lifestyle, using lifestyle medicine tools to motivate. I've found through the clinical work that I've done, which I don't do anymore, uh, back in um, that, that you, the body fat scales are, are tremendous for motivating the patient. You have to use them with a skilled eye because uh, sometimes they can be invalid according to uh, what the patient's been doing just, just before being weighed and they should be used at the same time of the day. But they are great, great motivating tools because weight is a terribly demotivating tool. You can actually go on a, a good weight loss program and increase your body weight whilst you decrease your body fat, particularly in the early weeks. And that's terribly demotivating for any patient. There's a, a number of different processes. The psychologists tend to fall back on cognitive behaviour therapy, which I don't find very useful. I was originally trained in psychology and I'm a, still a, a, a registered psychologist. I don't find that very useful. There's a lot of principles that I've learnt through social marketing um, that advertisers use that you can use in clinical practice. And here are three books that, there's a lot of rubbish out there too, but here are three books of which are really the Bible for this area. And, uh, some of these principles seven principles of influence uh, that come out of this book by Robert Cialdini, the head of psychology at uh, Chicago University. And uh, just seven principles that advertisers use all the time. It's the Bible. There's one principle called perceptual contrast. I won't go into the others, but if I've got time, Stuart, have I got, I've got five? Okay, I'll just read you an, a, an example of perceptual contrast. It's a letter from a... Uh, a girl who's at college to her mother and father. Dear mother and dad, since I left for college I've been remiss in writing and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness and not having written before. I'll bring you up to date now but before you read on please sit down. You're not to read any further unless you're sitting down, okay? Well then, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I got when I jumped out of the window of my dormitory when it caught on fire shortly after my arrival here is pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital and now I can see almost normally and I only get those sick headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm and he was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance. He also visited me in the hospital <clears throat> and since I had nowhere to live because of the burnout dormitory, he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. It's really a basement room but it's kind of cute. 
He's a very fine boy and we've fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married. We haven't got the exact date yet, but it'll be before my pregnancy begins to show. <laughs> yes, mother and dad, I am pregnant. I know how much you are looking forward to being grandparents. I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same love and devotion and tender care you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood tests and I carelessly caught it from him. He also goes on to talk about how the boyfriend is of a different race and religion, but the parents uh, should accept this. Uh, now that I've brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no dormitory fire. I didn't, did not have a concussion or skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I'm not engaged. I'm not infected. And there is no boyfriend. However, I'm getting a D in American history and an F in chemistry. <laughs> and I want you to see those marks in their proper perspective. That's just one of these principles of influence, perceptual contrast. There's a whole range there that I don't have time to go into. But, you know, we need to start looking at these. And the, the perceptual contrast you can use in clinical practice, you know, you give the patient the worst option first. You're going to have to go and run marathons, otherwise you're going to have a heart attack sort of thing. And then when the patient refuses that, then you say, well, you know, maybe all you've got to do is walk to the letterbox each day. It becomes much more acceptable once you've heard the worst option before you get the best option. This is what real estate agents do when they take you out to buy a house. They show you the worst houses first and then they take you to the one that they want to, want to uh, show you. There's another, one of these other books called Nudging, uh, which the basic principle, with a lot of these books you just have to read the title, you don't have to go into the book. But the basic principle here is that we have on the left hand side there all of the problems that, uh, that people have that we want to change, lifestyle problems and we tend to want to shift them to the other extreme in one hit. And it doesn't work that way. So by subtly changing one or two things, we can shift them along that continuum to get them to that end. But some will never get to that end. Some might only just get to there. Some might get to there. Some might get to there. It doesn't really matter as long as we're shifting, shifting them along there. So passive changes that can be made with the patient barely perceiving what's going on are changes that are going to be useful. Just finally, uh, the shared medical appointments I talked about, this is a, a principle where you work with uh, anything from 6 to 15 different patients in a room. The doctor does a normal consultation with those 6 to 15 patients. We've been doing this around the country, around the state of New South Wales now for the last couple of months. We've done a lot of 12 months of backup research. We're negotiating with MBS as to how this is funded, whether it's funded on an individual item basis. We've actually uh, now submitted, made a submission to MSAC, the Medical Services Advisory Council, for a special item number for group visits like this. Uh, you have a facilitator who actually runs the group. The doctor just works like a doctor. Individual patients, but other people can contribute. Other people in the room can contribute. I did one in Burke this week uh, with uh, 13 patients, one doctor, one facilitator, one practice nurse. Uh, and uh, you also can have a documenter there that's typing the records into the medical records. So the doctor's not looking at the computer. He's actually doing what he's supposed to be, he or she is doing what they're supposed to be doing. We had six Indigenous people in this room, in this group last week. Out of 13, all 13 wanted to come back and do this on an ongoing basis. They don't want to come back and do one-to-one -one consultation. And the doctor said that this is great because I don't have to repeat the same thing over and over, as you are as nurses to patients, which bores the hell out of you after a while. So it's a whole new process. Watch this space. Uh, there are a couple of articles we've done. The Australian Family Physician has published uh, these articles. There's now one in with the uh, British Medical Journal on this. It's a, it's a practice that has been uh, going on in America for, uh, for a while, but our system is quite different, and we're using it here for chronic disease and particularly for type 2 diabetes. And I'll just finish up by mentioning for anybody who is interested, there is an Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association. We do run uh, a postgraduate uh, certificate, diploma and masters in lifestyle medicine through Southern Cross University. It's all done online if anybody's interested. There are individual units like self-management in lifestyle medicine, introduction to lifestyle medicine, mood states in lifestyle medicine and so on. And you can find details of that at the website uh, there. Thank you very much.